thanks to everyone for joining. We are going to get started in just a minute here. We're waiting a moment while everyone ticks over from the hold room and we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, Amy, I think we can go ahead. That's great, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanna welcome you all and thank you for joining in the third, uh, actually fourth now, uh, in the series of webinars hosted by the Land and Water Conservation Fund Coalition, uh, breaking down LWCF by sub-programs throughout these last months and offering a window into the behind the scenes of project development um, program specifics and future opportunities for funding and partnering. Um, next slide. <clears throat> My name is Amy Lindholm. I, uh, with the Appalachian Mountain Club, I am the manager of the LWCF coalition. And on behalf of the thousands of groups in the coalition, I want to thank you all for joining today um, and for your efforts um, in concert with us to make full dedicated funding of LWCF a reality. Uh, I'm going to kick us off today with an abbreviated introductory overview here um, and a couple of updates and issues facing, um, facing decision makers in DC and how that's shaping our work. Um, <clears throat> then we're going to hear from federal program staff as well as partners working on the ground who will shed light into some great projects and best ways to engage in the project process. Um, <clears throat> Those include Kelly Nyland of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who uh, administers the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund program, uh, Leah Hong of the Trust for Public Land in Hawaii, Eliza Townsend, my colleague at the Appalachian Mountain Club in Maine, Tom Gilbert of New Jersey Conservation Foundation, Jay Raskew, also with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who administers the Highlands Conservation Act program, um, Nicole Wooten of Hudson Highlands Land Trust in New York, and Jack Stepford of Natural Lands in Pennsylvania. We have a great lineup of panelists. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So we're going to get started. Um, <clears throat> first, just to cover some highlights of what full funding of LWCF means looking ahead. Um, the guarantee of that consistent annual funding level uh, is really a game changer for all of us, um, providing certainty and the ability to plan ahead, um, which makes it more efficient to get great work done on the ground. Um, that's why we worked so hard for many years to get um, guaranteed full funding of LWCF. It's really important to note that LWCF is a diverse toolbox of 10 programs um, that, and, Uniquely, it has gone to every corner of the country, this, every state, every congressional district, um, and we are here to talk about um, those 10 sub-programs in this uh, webinar series. Um, <clears throat> in addition, among other things, full funding helps support the administration's America the Beautiful initiative, conserving public and private lands and waters, working with federal, state, local, and tribal partners, improving equitable access to the outdoors, and climate resiliency across landscapes. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot today about collaboration and partnerships um, on all of these locally driven projects. Um, so let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so what you see here is uh, the framework that Congress laid out when LWCF was permanently reauthorized in the Dingle Act a few years ago. It shows the 10 sub-programs under the umbrella of LWCF. We've covered most of these now during the previous sessions in the webinar series. And today we're focusing on two of the lesser known LWCF subprograms, the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund um, or section six and the Highlands Conservation Act program. As you'll hear today, uh, these two programs have very specific missions, uh, but they provide so many co-benefits that they often end up being the right tool for achieving much broader conservation and recreation goals. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so some current issues and opportunities going on in our work. Um, as many of you know, since LWCF was made mandatory uh, when full funding passed under the Great American Outdoors Act, um, it is now subject to sequestration, which puts a squeeze on the overall funding level. Um, that's a shortfall we would like to address moving forward. Um, 
with the reemergence of earmarks uh, in Congress, there are opportunities um, uh, in the appropriations process for community funding projects or community project funding. Um, and the House and Senate bills both did include um, earmarks that were specific LWCF projects. Um, <clears throat> And one very important priority for the coalition and our champions this year was to end the practice of rescissions or rescinding previous year funding that had not been used yet. Um, we want instead to see that money reprogrammed um, uh, into new projects. If those projects are truly dead, there are plenty of projects waiting in line um, <clears throat> and many growing unmet needs in the program. So we're happy to report success there in the, both the House and Senate bills for FY22. Um, and we hope that that carries through in conference and something that we're working on right now. Um, and <clears throat> hopeful that there'll be a full year appropriations bill. Um, this is really important, as I've mentioned, because LWCF is so oversubscribed, even with full funding. Um, one very clear example of that is almost $200 million in projects on supplemental agency lists this year, above and beyond what 900 million can fund. Um, these, and even those are just a fraction of the overall backlog um, across the country. So, these are some of the things that we're working on in terms of the pent up demand. It's worth noting that 900 million um, as passed by the Great American Outdoors Act is a floor, not a ceiling. Um, and in fact, last year, Congress provided $919 million for the program. Um, in addition, some, uh, some of you may have seen in the Build Back Better bill, um, there was included additional investment in both forest legacy and urban parks funding. If that bill becomes a reality and these provisions make make it through. Um, <clears throat> they are separate and outside of LWCF, but will enhance the existing funding and start to address those outsized needs that are being driven by the climate and nature crisis. Um, that includes in in currently inequitable access to nature's benefits for all. Next slide. <clears throat> So what can you do to help with that effort? Um, work with Congress and work with us to ensure the most conservation and recreation dollars are going to the program by the time the bill goes to the president. Um, help us support the funding in the Build Back Better Act bill. Um, support funding for individual projects and help develop good projects. That will, that's what we're here to learn about today. Um, <clears throat> telling the stories of how these dollars will impact your communities and promote uh, healthy economies is incredibly important, demonstrating that success moving forward and developing um, the pipeline of additional projects. Um, please engage with us at the LWCF Coalition. We continue to work on successful implementation all the time. We're here as a resource um, and we wanna know how we can be helpful. Uh, the LWCF Coalition website has an archive of all of these webinars, um, as well as a project toolkit that provides resources and information on each subprogram, eligibility, grant applications, agency contacts, um, and much more. So I'm going to pass on to my distinguished colleagues here um, who work to administer these programs and use the grant funding for important and inspiring conservation outcomes. Um, we're going to start with Kelly Nyland of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> so I'm Kelly Nyland. I'm with the Ecological Services Program at Fish and Wildlife Headquarters Office. Um, I have been administering the Section 6 grant program for about 11 or 12 years now. Prior to joining the service, I was part of the Federal Affairs team at the Trust for Public Land. So I have a real great appreciation for the amazing work that you all do um, and was really excited to get the invite to be on this panel today. So thanks for having me. Uh, next slide, please. So Section 6D of the Endangered Species Act uh, authorized the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund, which allowed the service to implement a financial assistance program to support the development and implementation of state and ter territorial programs to conserve and recover federally listed species. LW LWCF funds two of our Section 6 grant programs, the HCP Land Acquisition Program and the Recovery Land Acquisition Program. So only state agencies with cooperative agreements with the service are eligible applicants to apply directly for these funds, but we do encourage the states to work with local governments or NGOs as subrecipients on projects that are mutually beneficial. Both programs have a non-federal cost share requirement of 25%, uh, although that is dropped down to 10% when uh, states work collaboratively, collaboratively on a project. 
Uh, both of these programs are nationally competitive and what's unique about these programs is there is no minimum or maximum award. Um, so that allows us to give away some really um, big ticket grant awards. Next slide, please. So the HCP land acquisition program was developed in FY98 to assist in the acquisition of land, both fee and easements to complement but not replace the mitigation responsibilities of HCP permittees. Our average appropriation has remained pretty steady over the last decade, around 19.6 million. And each year we set aside at least 10% to support single species HCPs. Um, that hyperlink there, uh, you can go to in order to find out if there is HCPs in your area, or of course you can always reach out to your local uh, field office or regional office to identify HCPs near where you work. Next slide, please. So here I've just listed some of the merit review criteria that reflect our program priorities when selecting grants uh, in which we're going to give awards. Uh, we look at the number of federally listed and at-risk ca candidate species that might benefit from the project, the magnitude of that conservation benefit, uh, the ecosystem functionality, this relates to species occurrence on the habitat. We look at um, habitat connectivity, uh, the threat of conversion, you know, we have a, a limited amount of funding to give away and we always have more applicants than we can fund. So we look to see, you know, is this a project that needs to happen now? Maybe could it wait a year? Uh, we also really look at project readiness. We want these dollars to get into the ground as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and then we also look at voluntary cost share commitment. You know, again, with li limited federal dollars, <clears throat> excuse me, we want to leverage as much funding as possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in FY21, we, we received 82 million in requests from states. We were able to award out about 50 million. Uh, that came from two years of appropriations, our FY2021 appropriations, as well as $10.7 million in recovered funds. Our awards ranged from 286,000 to 12.6 million with an average grant award of <clears throat> 5 million. Through these grants, we allowed, we assisted the states in acquiring about 15,000 acres of land in six states that benefited 38 listed and at-risk species. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Our recovery land acquisition grant program was stood up in FY01 to assist in the acquisition of land in support of service approved recovery plans and outlines. In order to be eligible, a species recovery plan or outline must have habitat loss identified as a threat and have habitat protection identified as a priority recovery action. Uh, most species are eligible <laughs> under this criterion. Again, our average appropriation has remained really consistent over the last decade, hoping we'll get an increase. Um, it's around a little more than $11 million a year. And that website is a, a hyperlink to where uh, you can go to search through species recovery plans. Next slide, please. You'll see a lot of the merit review criteria we use to select project is the same as the HCP land acquisition program. With the exception of the first two criterion, uh, we look at the magnitude of benefit in relation to the recovery planner outline. Uh, you know, is this acquisition going to help us get to a down or delisting criteria? Uh, you know, are we uh, implementing a priority one or a priority two recovery action? And then we also look at the acquisition's contribution to population viability in terms of the three R's, which are resiliency, redundancy, and representation. And then again, those same five factors uh, we considered under HCP land acquisition. Next slide. In FY21, we received $36.5 million in requests. We were able to fund 29.2 million, again, with two years of appropriations and about $7 million in recovered funds. Those awards ranged from 300,000 to 5.25 with an average of 2.4. Through the RLA grant program, uh, we're assisting the states in acquiring over 41,000 acres of land in 11 states to the benefit of 20 listed species. Next slide. So just some fun facts, all in all, uh, <laughs> We are uh, enabling the acquisition of over 56,000 acres of land, which is equivalent to 65 central parks, uh, 40,000 football fields, or for any Joni Mitchell fans out there, 15 million parking spots. Next slide. 
So looking forward to FY22, we are getting set to release our notices of funding opportunities. We're not expecting any major changes from FY21. So if you want a sneak peek, you can always go back and find those NOFOs on grants.gov. Um, we just made some minor changes. You know, the last administration uh, required us to assign points to secretarial priorities. So we've, uh, we've redistributed those points and just added some clarifying language to help applicants give us what we need in terms of conducting our merit review. Um, we expect, I expect the NOFOs to be posted by mid-February, although honestly, I'll tell you my target date is January 30th. Um, if you were part of an application in FY21, you want to try to apply again in 22, uh, we encourage you to seek feedback from your regional office. We anticipate to announce our awards in June or July of this year. And then we wanna start getting on an earlier um, timeline for these grants. So we really wanna get our 23 NOFO posted prior to the close of this fiscal year. Next slide. Thanks. So just some tips for success. <laughs> it's uh, not brain science, right? Or brain surgery, <laughs> rocket science maybe. <laughs> Write to the NOFO and read the FAQs. Uh, we spent a lot of FY20 breaking out um, our grant programs to have separate notices of funding opportunities, um, really providing applicants with directions on how to write a successful application, um, facilitate our merit review so that we can get these awards out faster um, and we can get conservation on the ground sooner. Um, please include only information on eligible species, uh, respond to each of the current merit review criteria you know, you don't want to miss out on any opportunity to earn points and um, improve the ranking of your application. Um, the NOFOs uh, include example response tables. We can't uh, force applicants to provide us information in any certain format that's not improved, uh, approved by OMB. But if you follow the example response tables that are provided, um, you know, it helps merit review go quicker and again, helps us get us, uh, helps us get money out the door quicker. Uh, next slide. FY22 is gonna be highly competitive, right? Especially if we get a full year CR. Should the average award amount remain consistent with that of 21, we'd only be looking at funding four HCP land acquisition grants in 22 and five RLA. So it would really behoove you to identify if partial funding is acceptable um, and, you know, something that we look at is past performance. So if there are balances on prior year awards, provide an update on progress made to date in a spend plan. Um, and we have heard that some states are considering, you know, imposing their own self caps on individual awards. Um, so coordinating with the state early and often is highly encouraged. And final slide, please. Here are just some pictures from the amazing projects funded in FY21. And that one in the middle, probably one of my favorites, uh, Dawn on Silver Lake, uh, will be highlighted. So thanks a bunch for your time. I know I moved through these uh, slides pretty quickly and I'm happy to provide a PDF. Thanks. Well, great, aloha. Um... My name is uh, Leah Hong. Um, I'm the Hawaiian Island State Director for the Trust for Public Land. And I have been asked to speak about the Trust for Public Land's partnership with the State of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources, Division of Forestry and Wildlife to acquire Kamehame Nui on Maui uh, via the US Fish and Wildlife Services Habitat Conservation Fund Land Acquisition Grant Program. Next slide. So the right corner of this map shows the Hawaiian Islands and Maui. Where this project is located is the second largest of the main Hawaiian Islands. The project Kamehame Nui is shown in orange in the middle of the map and consists of about, of about 3,433 acres in upcountry Maui. And uh, as you can see from the map, the property is uh, surrounded by protected federal and state lands with Haleakala National Park directly to the east in the forest green color and um, to the right. And the state protected lands 
to the north and south in that sort of lighter green mint color. Um, and then uh, sort of uh, privately protected lands through conservation easement and sort of the yellowish green. So you can see that this property was part of a larger protected landscape of probably over 50,000 acres. Um, the map's a little bit busy, but you can sort of see, uh, it, it sort of explains why we applied for Habitat Conservation Plan Land Acquisition Grant, um, a grant. Uh, you can see uh, to the south of the parcel in red, in the red box and the black box, there were two pre-existing wind mitigation areas that are there. You can also see in the um, little uh, white boxes that are in the border of the property and Haleakala National Park, they have little birds there. Those are petrol observation sites. And then you see in the, the black circles kind of uh, also near Haleakala with a little bat symbol. <laughs> Those are also bat observation sites. The, the, the cross hatched purple areas are um, Nene goose, Hawaiian goose um, distribution areas. And the sort of bluish cross hatched areas also represent the um, Blackburn's sphinx moth critical habitat areas. So this, this map tells um, you know, a story <laughs> for the Habitat Conservation Plan program. Um, next slide. So Kamehameha Nui, which is the traditional name of the Hawaiian land division of this area, or Ahupua'a, um, was also known as the Von Temsky Erwan Ranch um, in upcountry Kula on Maui. Um, fun fact, it was established in the 1800s um, by Louis Von Temsky. Erwan is actually nowhere, uh, spelled backwards. Uh, so he had a sense of humor um, and his granddaughter Armin von Temsky was a famous writer who wrote several books about Hawaii, one of which was turned into a quote, talkie movie um, in the early 1900s starring Clara Bow. Uh, next slide. The ranch is beautiful. Um, portions of the upper ranch um, have intact forest and subalpine habitat. Um, next slide. And the reason why um, we received a HCP grant uh, is because uh, the ranch um, implicated four uh, endangered species um, with habitat conservation plans. And so um, I think Kelly explained the program, but, but technically what happens is, you know, if you have a project, say like a large utility scale wind project in this instance, um, and it, it ends up taking, i.e. killing or harming, um, endangered species, uh, you need an incidental take permit and you need to develop a habitat conservation plan in, in concert with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in the case of this project, there were several uh, large wind projects on Maui uh, that had uh, these habitat conservation plans. Um, and in, in this case, there were four endangered species, um, the Uwal or the Hawaiian petrel, uh, which nested in the uplands. Um, and uh, there was suspected uh, nesting sites on this property based on the, the petrol stations that I pointed out earlier. Um, the nene goose, the, the state bird of Hawaii, uh, there was upland nesting and uh, food sources and habitat on the property. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Opeapea, or the native Hawaiian hori bat, which is the state's land mammal, the, the official state land mammal. Uh, and uh, because of the bat detection sites, there was a high likelihood of presence uh, of the bats on this property. They're very cryptic, so they're actually pretty hard to, to find. I've heard stories of um, scientists stand, all standing around. How many scientists does it take to find a bat, you know, standing around a tree with, they know, the bat's there because there's a sensor on there, but they can't see it um, because it looks like a leaf. Um, and then, of course, the Blackburn Sphinx moth, which um, also, you know, uh, was suspected to be there because of um, its location. Uh, the property was between two management units. It was adjacent to critical habitat. The property was, in fact, proposed for critical habitat at one time, but then was taken off for various reasons. Um, uh, this 
Blackburn Sphinx moth is the largest insect for Hawaii, and the larva of the Blackburn Sphinx moth is the size of a hot dog, uh, which is a little scary. Um, next slide. <laughs> so just some project statistics. This closed back in uh, 2020. Um, the new owner and steward, our partner, the state of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources. The funding was a bit of a quilt, um, included the USDA Forest Service um, Forest Legacy pr Program, 3.8 million, US Fish and Wildlife Service, ATP Acquisition, Land Acquisition Grant Program, and a legislative appropriation. The, the total was $9.8 million. Um, a little bit of a sticker shock, I know, in other parts of the country, but this is not unusual for upcountry Maui or other parts of, of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, I would encourage folks to work very closely with their, you know, with their state uh, fish and wildlife, you know, department in in developing the application um, and the regional U.S. Fish and Wildlife staff. Um, they were just in, incredibly helpful in contributing uh, to the the various layers of the GIS, the maps, um, and the the narrative, and all of the statistics related to the endangered species that were impacted by these wind energy projects. Um, and I, I think, next slide. So the future um, of this property is that it is in the process of being added to the state's forest reserve. The upper 2,168 acres will be withdrawn from a ranching lease effective this summer. And the remainder of the parcel is expected to be withdrawn from the lease in the next five years. Um, the state is in the process of developing a community-based management plan, including, of course, native ecosystem restoration, watershed restoration, endangered species recovery, reforestation, um, uh, accommodation to native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices, and outdoor recreation, including trails and hiking. Um, so I'm very sorry I can't stay, but because um, my CEO and president is visiting Hawaii right now, and uh, but I have to run off. But thank you so much for the opportunity to present about this project. What a great project, Leah. I'm Eliza Townsend. I'm the Maine Conservation Policy Director for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And I'm pleased to share with you how LWCF funds are supporting habitat recovery for the endangered Atlantic salmon in fully the opposite corner of the country. Next slide, please. Uh, founded in 1876, AMC is the nation's oldest conservation, recreation, and education organization with the mission to foster the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the outdoors. You may know us best from the high mountain huts in New Hampshire's White Mountains. AMC played a role in the 1911 passage of the Weeks Act, which led to the creation of the White Mountain National Forest and subsequently 39 other national forests. Next slide. But a century later, AMC undertook a bold new initiative, landscape scale conservation in the 100 mile wilderness area of Maine, a rugged and remote area surrounding the last 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail. The Maine Woods Initiative is cradled within the largest contiguous expanse of undeveloped forest in the Eastern United States. Next slide. AMC's model couples land conservation with sustainable forestry, carbon sequestration, habitat restoration, backcountry recreation, and outdoor education. Our first purchase of the 37,000 acre Katahdin Ironworks property was made possible in part by a four and a half million dollar forest legacy grant. Since then, we've assembled 75,000 acres of those, more than a third, 27,000 acres, are in ecological reserves. We operate three backcountry lodges, maintain 130 miles of trails open to the public, and sustainably harvest between 6,500 and 7,000 cords of wood annually. We hold two carbon contracts with a third in process, which together total 50,000 acres of forest land. The newest contract covers actively managed lands and is compatible with our long-term timber management and harvest goals. Next slide. An important component of the Maine Woods Initiative is a watershed scale habitat restoration effort for native brook trout and Atlantic salmon. Maine is the last stronghold for wild native brook trout, a prized and, as you can see, beautiful sport fish that requires clear cold water as habitat. 
and Maine has the only remaining population of the Atlantic salmon in the United States. The Atlantic salmon is known as the king of fish for its size, for its beauty, and for its taste. It's delicious. Uh, it is anadromous, beginning life in fresh water for two to three years before traveling to the North Atlantic, where it reaches adulthood in salt water, before returning to its home its home river to spawn. Dams, habitat destruction, pollution, overfishing have drastically reduced the population, resulting in its listing as an endangered species in the year 2000. Next slide. But a really uh, unprecedented and imaginative project, the Penobscot River Restoration Project, which was completed in 2016, removed two dams and created state-of-the-art fish passage at a third, which opened 2,000 miles of rivers and streams to sea-run fish habitat and offered real hope for the Atlantic salmon. In turn, it created the opportunity for further habitat conservation upstream. Next slide. AMC lands include more than 20 miles of the west branch of the Pleasant River, a headwater tributary of the Penobscot, which drains the highest mountains of central Maine. The Pleasant River watershed is critical Atlantic salmon habitat. The west branch is known for Gulf Hagus. You can see a piece of it there on the left hand, which is a rugged gorge where the river drops 400 feet in four miles. But the Pleasant has other characteristics, and in fact, a state fishery biologist referred to it as as close to pristine as possible, an ecological treasure trove. Next slide. So AMC has protected nearly the entirety of the West Branch. Working with a range of partners, we've opened 64 miles of spawning habitat by replacing barriers such as you see on the left. That's a hanging culvert, and fish simply will not jump up that and, and continue up a stream. And we've replaced them with what you see on the right, which is a stream crossing, which restores the natural state of the stream. We're also working with partners like Trout Unlimited and a, a range of state level partners to restore woody debris to create natural conditions because these were streams and rivers that were heavily used to transport logs during Maine's lumbering heyday. And in fact, they were bulldozed and in some cases even dynamited to, to clear passage for the logs. So we're restoring woody debris, which creates shade and resting spots for fish. With the flow to the ocean reopened by the Penobscot River Restoration Project, biologists began planting Atlantic salmon eggs in 2016. And since then, adults have returned to their native headwaters in the Pleasant River for the first time in 180 years. It just, I get goosebumps every time I think about it. Next slide. So the meadow branch of the Pleasant River is particularly valuable for salmon, and it represents a huge opportunity to restore its habitat. It's also relatively accessible. It's near a state highway, which is the route to Baxter State Park, a very a beloved destination. And due to its proximity to that recreation opportunity and others, it's ripe for the kind of development that has absolutely skyrocketed in Maine as a result of the pandemic. It also uh, has long been logged for, uh, for commercial forestry, but the land surrounding the middle branch also contains deposits of cobalt and zinc, and it was therefore the subject of active interest from a Canadian mining company. You see here the Pleasant River Headwaters Forest is in blue, and the remainder of AMC's holdings are in gold. We're very fortunate that our colleagues at the Conservation Fund stepped in at that moment with bridge financing to purchase the 27,000 acre Pleasant River headwaters in 2019. Though the property represents just one half of 1% of the land base of the 5 million acre Penobscot watershed, it provides 8.2% of the habitat units needed to accomplish habitat restoration and connectivity for the Atlantic salmon. And the Pleasant River Headwaters Forest encompasses 90% of the middle branches watershed. The Conservation Fund agreed to hold the land until AMC could secure the funds needed to take ownership by the end of this year. And it has generously allowed us to manage the property in the interim. In 2020, they alerted us to the availability of the Recovery Land Acquisition Grant, 
available, as Kelly pointed out, to states or territories that have entered into cooperative agreements with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for endangered and threatened species conservation. You can imagine how excited we were to learn about this funding source. We reached out to the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and they quickly saw the value of the project and agreed to serve as the primary applicant. We learned that a site visit was a condition of the application, and we were fortunately able to pull one together quickly before winter. It was October of 2020. And one year later, the Fish and Wildlife Service awarded the project a $4.1 million recovery land acquisition grant putting us on track to meet our deadline to permanently protect this exceptionally rich salmon habitat. The grant represents about 16% of the total project, which has been funded with a mix of private, foundation, and federal dollars, including more than a million dollars from the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. Next slide. We are deeply grateful for this grant. While the focus of conservation of conservation is the endangered Atlantic salmon. We expect that it will also benefit not only brook trout, but also the endangered Canada lynx and the Northern long-eared bat, which is a federally threatened species. And finally, the American black duck, which needs forest. Next slide, please. And we're really proud of this work, all of our work, honored to play a role in conserving the king of fish. We'd like to invite you to come up and visit this extraordinary landscape for yourself. It's a wonderful example of the value of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We're really grateful. Thank you, Kelly. And I will pass the microphone to Tom Gilbert. Thanks very much, Eliza. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tom Gilbert. and. I'm co-executive director of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Uh, we've been working since 1960 to preserve land and natural resources for the benefit of all. And we uh, have a very long history of supporting the Land and Water Conservation Fund and uh, working to protect the Highlands region. Um, and I do personally as well, this feels like a bit of a homecoming for me. Um, I was the executive director of the Highlands Coalition from 2002 to 2004, when the Highlands Conservation Act was passed. And I worked uh, over a decade uh, with various organizations, AMC, uh, Trust for Public Land on the LWCF full funding campaign, and just have to give a huge shout out to the LWCF coalition and everyone involved for uh, working over decades, uh, persisting and uh, finally accomplishing full funding for Land and Water Conservation Fund. Huge congrats. Um, so I'm gonna give a very brief history of land and water conservation fund and the highlands region next slide please first um, just a brief introduction to the highlands region if you're not familiar with it you can see the uh, map of the region here and it's essentially the easternmost ridge of the appalachian chain as it borders the metropolitan in new york city and, and philadelphia metropolitan areas as a result, there are tens of millions of people that are within an hour's drive of this region, uh, which makes it very uh, precious and very, uh, very threatened uh, by, uh, you know, by, you know, obviously intense uh, development pressure. One of the things that really defines the region <clears throat> are that it contains numerous key drinking water supplies in New Jersey and New York in particular. In New Jersey, there's a series of reservoirs that provide uh, the drinking water supply to over half the state's population. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a, a iconic photo of the region that uh, was very much central to the you know the, the campaign, uh, working to protect it. And um, you know, it was a slogan that we had during the campaign. We talked about the Highlands as our backyard paradise because that's really what defines it. It's really quite incredible that you have these large, uh, you know, intact forests that are so close to to New York City as uh, as captured in this photo. Again, that's what makes it very special and very, very threatened. Next slide, please. There's a long history of federal uh, federal involvement in the Highlands, uh, really beginning with the, with the U.S. Forest Service. There there were several uh, U.S. Forest Service uh, state and private forestry studies. First one in 1992. Uh, which looked at the New York, New Jersey Highlands portion of the region and documented the national significance uh, based on some of those values that, that I mentioned and the, and the water resources, the forest resources in particular. 
Uh, that study was then updated in 2002, and the study uh, uh, took a looked at a, a broader region, which included portions of the original line as it extends into Pennsylvania and Connecticut. And that included extensive GIS analysis um, of the forest, water, wildlife, and, and recreation uh, resources of the region. And so that kind of forest service study and imprimatur of national significance, um, you know, they were, it was significant to then the federal investment in the region that, uh, you know, followed those studies. Um, through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Next slide. And so the first example of that really is, uh, is Sterling Forest, uh, a magnificent forest, 20,000 acres of forest owned by the Sterling Forest Corporation in the, uh, in the New York Highlands, close to the New York, New Jersey border. Um, in the late 80s, it was, um, there was a, a massive development proposal, some uh, 14,000 housing units, and 2 million square feet of commercial development proposed for, for Sterling Forest. And numerous organizations, um, national, regional, state, and local banded together. And uh, there was it was a 10 year fight um, that ultimately resulted in the acquisition of the parcel and the creation of Sterling Forest State Park in 1998. And Part of what made that possible was an appropriation of 17.5 million from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which uh, you know was matched with state funding and significant private funding, and that really became the model of the of the Highlands Conservation Act. And again, it was that 1992 U.S. Forest Service study that recognized the national significance of the region, um, that identified the high the high priority gems within that region, including Sterling Forest. That was kind of foundational to the uh, the federal investment. Next slide, please. And so ultimately, that then led to um, the Highlands Conservation Act, uh, which was enacted in two thousand and four, which was uh, just a couple of years on the heels of the second U.S. Forest Service study, uh, sponsored by Congressman Rodney Freelingheisen from New Jersey, with bipartisan support across the four state delegation. <clears throat> and the act authorized 10 million annually uh, over 10 years for land conservation partnership projects, very similar to Sterling Forest, and these would be, um, the funds would flow to the states and be matched by the states uh, for lands identified as uh, you know, high value in the, in the Forest Service study. Interestingly, and I just was refreshing my history on this a little bit, the act did not specify LWCF as the funding source in its final form anyway, but the way it played out, uh, the appropriations, um, you know, did flow through LWCF in beginning in FY07. And, and subsequently, you can see it started out at relatively modest funding levels and, and ramped up uh, over time and eventually reached, uh, reached uh, full, uh, full funding. The, um, <clears throat> the grants have been administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as we're going to hear in a moment from from Jay, they've done an amazing job. Of course, have a, a great track record of working on uh, these types of cooperative grants with the states. And the program has uh, preserved uh, a significant uh, amount of land uh, over the years. And I think we're going to um, learn more about that from Jay. So I will I will leave it at that. And um, at this point, turn it over to uh, turn it over to Jay with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Um, that was a great overview. Um, so really happy to be here to highlight the Highlands Conservation Act program. Um, I work for with land acquisition grants through the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Highlands is one of my favorite for sure. And um, the region I work in is the North Atlantic Appalachian region of the service. It spans from West Virginia up to Maine. Um, I've been here for two and a half years. <clears throat> Before that, I worked at with a regional land land trust and a regional uh, land conservation partnership in Massachusetts. So I really appreciate all the work that um, the land trusts are doing and everybody here has been doing to save important land. So I just have um, three slides and I will focus on some of the things that we look at dealing with um, land protection with the highlands. Um, and this slide here is just a picture of uh, Northern Green State Forest in New Jersey where the highlands has helped protect, I think around 420 acres. Um, right, next slide, please. Excuse me, so as Tom mentioned, the Highlands 
um, spans 3.4 million acres across four states. And it's such an amazing spot. It has a lot of um, really critical habitat for federally listed and at-risk wildlife like the bog turtle, uh, New England cottontail. And it's a place where millions of Americans can get out and enjoy the outdoors. And you know what's so remarkable, as Tom mentioned, is that it's just in the backyard of places like New York City, Hartford, Connecticut, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia. Um, it's surprising that a place that has so many farms and forests and, and wild places is still there. So it's um, it's uh, uh, it's amazing that people had the foresight, like Tom and others, to really fight to to save this landscape. Um, so the Highlands Conservation Act it talks about conserving land in this area that has um, having high conservation value or focusing on high priority conservation land with important resources around areas of water, forest, agriculture, wildlife, recreational, and cultural resources. So it's pretty broad. There's a lot of possibilities here for land protection. And this map here we're looking at um, shows the Highland region in, in light green, conserved land in dark green, and it shows um, most of the 98 projects that have happened so far in red. Um, so far, there's been 12,667 acres conserved. Um, so the service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, we administer the program in close partnership with the state conservation agencies from Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania, also the U.S. Forest Service, and of course, the, the nonprofit land conservation um, land trusts and organization folks are, are critical to making this whole thing happen. So our, our role is pretty limited as a service. You know, the partners are doing all the work, finding the landowners, putting these great projects together, submitting them for us to review. Um, and we are just making sure it kind of fits into the um, parameters of the act. So um, currently state conservation agencies are the only ones that are eligible to apply for funding and to hold the conservation easement. And the Highlands covers 50% of the cost of those land acquisition projects. But certainly the work in this landscape um, uh, is being seen currently by the current administration as a really important tool for meeting the conservation um, or getting to the America the Beautiful goals of, of protecting 30% of America's lands and, and waters by 2030. Next slide, please. Um, so as mentioned, the Highlands Conservation Act legislation points to the US Forest Service studies as the areas um, that identify places that have this high conservation value. And this map here just shows um, all the areas in that light blue color, you can see that, those are all eligible. So there's a lot of eligible areas um, in the Highlands that can receive funding. And so funding is broken up in two different um, funding rounds. There's a base round and a competitive round. With the base funding round, each state can apply for typically $1.46 million. And the state conservation agencies work with um, folks like Nicole and Jack, who, who we'll hear in a minute, to identify the most important projects that they want to submit to the Forest Service for review. And at, at that base funding level, it really is just a matter of are the parcels uh, you know, meeting the goals of the Act? Are they in the blue area? And are they meeting the matching requirements? Then there's another round called the competitive funding round. Um, typically, there's about $5 million available each year for that. And those grants compete at the regional level um, and there's a different scoring criteria. So um, for the most part, or uh, the way it works is for the, the scoring criteria, you know, parcels that have um, sort of better wildlife habitat, have more at-risk species, um, have uh, water resources of importance, um, are adjacent to conservation land, are identified in conservation plans, um, all those things add up to points and that's all clearly outlined in our notice of funding opportunities. So you can you know, position projects to, to score as high as possible. But at the basic level, those competitive round projects also have to be um, in, the, in the light blue area and meet that 50% uh, match, non-federal match. So we're gonna have a competitive grant round posted in the next few weeks um, of actually about $8 million. That'll be uh, closing in April and then we'll have uh, another round of base funding and another round of competitive running being posted in May. Um, the application put up in May and then um, uh, closing probably around in, in November of this year. So again, there's a lot of flexibility with what can be funded with the Highlands Conservation Act funds. 
because um, there's so much eligible land and, and so many resources that the act points to. Um, and that's really kind of neat about this program, I'd, I'd have to say. Um, next, last slide, please. Um, just a note on what's happening with the Highlands Conservation Act going forward. Um, the, uh, our, all our partners in the Highlands, Highland Coalition with Mark Zakatansky and others um, have um, made sure that Congress is looking at the Highlands Conservation Reauthorization Act right now. Um, if passed, that will um, provide funding for seven more years. It'll up the amount that could be given to 20 million a year from 10 million. And it's moving quite nicely, I guess, through Congress. Just got out of the Natural Resources Committee yesterday, thanks to everybody's work. Um, and so that Reauthorization Act will change a, a couple of, or a few um, things about the, about the program. Um, it'll allow for the most updated or more updated scientific and, and GIS data to be used to, to find eligible projects, to make them eligible, not just rely on the, those older uh, forest service studies. Um, it'll provide really needed um, administrative funds to state conservation agencies. It'll provide a, um, a mechanism for agencies to um, request adding new municipalities to the Highlands region to expand the region. Um, it will allow for different appraisal methodologies if they are in conflict with state law. And uh, one last thing to mention is it will also, also expand the, the number of eligible entities that can hold land to also include um, municipalities and counties. So we're really thrilled about the Reauthorization Act. We're, we're really um, uh, I, I'm just overwhelmed or, or excited about how, how well the partnership works, how much work happens with um, the land trust and state agency uh, partnership. A lot of great work is happening there. So thanks to folks like Tom who made this, helped make this happen. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Nicole and Jack who are doing the work on the ground to make, make this, this program really work effectively. So and that's it. Thanks so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to, to uh, Nicole. Great, thank you so much, Jay. I am Nicole Wooten. I'm the Director of Natural Resources at the Hudson Highlands Land Trust, which is located in New York. And I'm gonna, uh, I have the opportunity to share some examples of how the Highlands Conservation Act funds have been used on the ground in New York's beautiful Highlands region, which you see here in this photo. Next slide, please. So this is another photo of the Highlands of New York from over the Hudson River. And these are the traditional lands of the Wappinger, Lenape, Delaware, and Mohican nations. Uh, next, please. And you can see in this map, the Hudson River is the blue line between the east and western New York Highlands. And the yellow line is the Appalachian Trail, which I'll talk about soon. You'll also notice in the inset map that we're located just 60 miles north of New York City. Uh, so this is, as Tom mentioned, a very precious and threatened area as well as a very popular and accessible backyard to millions. And the stars that you see on this map point to two projects that I'll focus on. One is with the Hudson Highland State Park Preserve to the north, and one is with the Appalachian Trail to the south. And before I dive into those, I know Amy broke down that the Land and Water Conservation Fund goes into state and federal pools and very fortunately for us, the state pool, the Highlands Conservation Act is very collaborative um, as Jay also mentioned. So the New York Highlands Network is a group of nonprofit land trusts, municipalities and state agencies like New York State Parks and Department for Environmental Conservation as well as the Palisades Interstate Parkway Commission. And together we all work on protecting the most precious lands in this area. And we all have different strengths uh, we help identify opportunities for conservation, build relationships with landowners, analyze conservation values, and some of us get our boots on the ground and long-term stewardship of these lands. So we are grateful for having our fantastic federal partners. And since 2007, New York has applied $10 million from the Land and Water Conservation Fund's Highlands Conservation Act. Uh, which has been more than double matched on the state side to protect over 4,000 acres of land from Sterling Forest in the West, as Tom showed, to the Great Swamp in the East uh, near the Housatonic Valley. And that doesn't even count the projects that are in progress or closed very recently. So we're focusing on connecting and conserving wildlife habitat, public recreation, 
and drinking water. And as you can see here, this is a great example of a recent project with the Hudson Highland State Park Preserve. So Hudson Highland State Park Preserve is an 8,000 acre park with 70 miles of trails. Uh, it includes everything from uh, rare species to keystone predators like bald eagle, bobcat and bear, to beautiful ephemeral wildflowers like this cardinal flower here, to headwater streams and even boasts a castle. Um, and a recent partnership project between Scenic Hudson Land Trust and New York State Parks added over 900 acres to the park to connect Breakneck Ridge and Mount Beacon. Next slide, please. So Breakneck Ridge, many of you may know uh, because it was the number one day hike in the United States a few years back and it's still very popular. The trailhead is located right on the train line from New York City to Poughkeepsie. So thousands of people come out on beautiful summer days and experience these lands. And the Highlands Conservation Act funds have been vital in striking a balance to enhance this popular hiking experience and its incredible scenic views, and also to protect the incredibly biodiverse lands that surround it from development and overuse. Next slide, please. So speaking of hiking, I also wanted to highlight the Appalachian Trail and the Appalachian Trail landscape that surrounds it. So the Appalachian Trail is a 2000 mile long trail that runs from Maine to Georgia and it goes right through the heart of the highlands in New York. It's also a giant wildlife connectivity corridor because it's sometimes the only thing that connects two larger wildlife habitats. So think of it as a large backbone for conservation along the East Coast. And uh, that is the case for a recent land protection project that happened in the highlands which was thanks to New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, Appalachian Trail volunteers and staff. They noted that there was a, a 32 acre parcel that was very important to the Appalachian Trail that was for sale. Uh, Hudson Highlands Land Trust, the organization that I work for, analyzed the conservation values of this land and started a relationship with the landowner. And then the Open Space Institute helped shepherd the project forward to the finish line alongside New York State Parks. Uh, so together we protected these 32 acres of key wildlife habitat, uh, which has multiple species of greatest conservation need that live right across a movement corridor between two parks. Advance the slide, please. Thank you. So you can see here those two parks to the north is Fawnstock State Park and to the south is Hudson Highland State Park. Right in the middle in the dark green is that 32 acre property. And uh, it includes as I said, species of greatest conservation need like the Eastern box turtle, you can see in the bottom left, as well as wood turtle, it's habitat for endangered bats and many other species. So um, the Appalachian Trail in this area is sort of a, a line between the two parks, a connective tissue between them. Uh, and is another way that we get to work with our federal partners as well as state partners. Uh, knowing that any land that is protected along this trail is connecting into something much greater ecologically. Next slide, please. So these were just two of uh, at least 16 fantastic projects that have been funded by Highlands Conservation Act funds in New York. There are always many more waiting in the wings. Uh, so to learn more about it, if you'd like to get involved or just read more, please visit our website, hhlt.org and feel free to reach out. And I encourage everyone to stay involved in your local environmental policy and planning efforts. It's always important. Stay in touch with your representatives and get out there to enjoy these lands. So I will go ahead and pass the mic over to Jack uh, Stafford with Natural Lands. Thank you. Yeah, hello, I'm, I'm Jack Stafford with Natural Lands. I'm the Senior Director of land protection for natural lands. And I have a story for you. Um, next slide. Almost exactly 14 years ago, um, I was hunting with some friends. Um, we had permission to hunt on a 234 acre, basically mountain. Um, beautiful sunny day, crisp air, a um, little bit of snow on the ground. Uh, we'd gotten a few deer, we we're down at the trucks, um, about to have lunch and the landowner came up had lunch with us and we're sitting on the tailgate swapping stories. Um, and he casually mentions that he's got a, you know, he's been working on development plans for the property. Um, 
And he said, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in uh, doing the construction work myself. I think I'll just sell the property and be done with it. Um, clearly, my interest is piqued. And I say, hey, you know, why don't you sell it to us? You know, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll conserve it and not, not develop it. Um, we talked for a little while longer and, and he said, you know, if, if you can get me a fair price, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sell you the land. Um, we talked a little bit more and, and parted ways for the day. Uh, in complete candor, I had no idea how I was going to make this work. You know, I, I knew that I could get some state funding. The Open Space Institute had some funding. And, you know, for my, for my back of the napkin, you know, looking at it, I figure, you know, I can probably get 65, maybe 70% of the funding for the fair market value, whatever that may be. Um, but I didn't know where I was going to get the rest of the money, nor did I have any idea who might be able to own it. Uh, next slide, please. What I did know is it a beautiful mountain, um, fully timbered, um, southeast of, of the town of Reading along the Schuylkill River and the Route 422 corridor. Hundreds of thousands of people on the Route 30, 422 corridor dry pies this stunning mountain every, every year. Next slide. Uh, what I did know was that the Allegheny Creek flows along the, along the base of this hill. Um, high quality waters as stocks, trout, trout, stocked trout stream. Next slide. What I did know is, is the mountain has got tons of American chestnut sprouts. Over a hundred years ago, the, the chestnut blight wiped out the, the, the American chestnuts, but this mountain has root stock that continues to have root sprouts on it. Next slide, please. What I did know is, is this was in an area that we call the Hopewell Big Woods, which is one of the largest unbroken wooded blocks um, between Baltimore and, and the city of, 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 of New York, um, and vitally important to protect. The Hopewell Big Woods right now today has about 15,000 permanently protected wooded acres. Next slide, please. What I did know is that Berks County Open Space Plans list, list this property in the Greenway Corridor. They see it as a high, rec, a high ecologic value. The state of Pennsylvania has listed the Schuylkill Highlands, this, this region, as, as one of their conservation landscapes. Next slide, please. What I did know is that this property has 200 and some acres of interior forest habitat, vitally important for, the, for migrating the open tropical songbirds. Next slide, please. What I did know was that the developer was going to put 30 some houses on the tippy top of this hill. Tippy top of the hill. It would have been an enormous blight on the landscape. Um, so I ordered an appraisal. The appraisal came back in at somewhere around like a million, a million 250. Gave the gave the appraisal to the landowner. The landowner said, "Hey, you know, that's that's fair. You know, if you can, you know, get that money for me, I'll, I'll sell it to you." I still had no idea, you know, where I was going to get the remaining funds. Nor did I have an idea of who the future landowner would be. But I started working on the agreement of sale, and out of the blue, I get a call from from Tom Ford, who's um, who worked for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And he says, Jack, I've been working on a conservation project in Lancaster County for the last four years, and it died. I've got some Federal Highlands Act funding that, that the grant is about to run out, and I need to spend it. Would you happen to have a project? So, so, <laughs> so now I knew that we had money. Um, the, the problem was that I still didn't know who a landowner would be. Clearly, it was not going to be natural lands because the Highlands Act funds can't go to a nonprofit as for an ownership standpoint. Um, we we looked at Bureau of State Parks, but it didn't fit, fit didn't fit Bureau of State Parks ownership portfolio. So we looked to the Bureau of Forestry, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry. Um, they at that time had not had an acquisition in southeastern Pennsylvania in 25 years. But regardless, we packed our bags and went to Harrisburg um, and, and sat down with them to see if we could work out a deal. 
in talking with them, they said, Jack, you know, we don't have any money for acquisition, but I'll tell you what, if you can buy the property and give it to us free of charge, we'll accept ownership. So a year and a half later with funding from the Highlands Act, um, Pennsylvania's um, the conservation, community conservation partnership program, Open Space Institute and some William Penn funding, we transferred, we bought and transferred this property to the Bureau of State Park as the Gibraltar Forest. Um, next slide. Since that time, I've done another 25 acquisitions using Highlands Act funds following pretty much the same model, including Poplar Crossing, another 40 some acres. Next slide, please. Next, next to the Gibraltar Forest. Then the Bucci property. Next slide, please. Another 13 acres to, to Gibraltar. Next slide, please. And finally, right next door, the next hill over from, from Gibraltar, which is Seidel Hill. Next slide. Added to, the, added to the Gibraltar Hill also. Next slide. And finally end up with almost 400 acres, which is now the, which is now the, Gibral the Pennsylvania Gibraltar State Forest. And we're looking for, and we're looking at adjacent lands to add right now, and that's the end of my presentation. That was awesome, Jack. Thank you for the story. I'm going to come back on and just say thank you to all of our amazing panelists. That was such a great like way to back clean up there. Uh, Jack, that was a great way to end it. Um, but all of our speakers today are were super compelling, um, lots of helpful information from a practical standpoint, but also a lot of inspiration from an advocacy standpoint and for stakeholders who are not actually doing projects, but who want to support those who are. Um, that's kind of the point of this webinar series. Um, and so thank you all so much for participating. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the Q&A box, um, but I'm gonna hang out here um, in case anyone wants to put any in there. Um, but <clears throat> in the meantime, you know, if any of our panelists have parting thoughts, um, please feel free to share. Well, I'll just say what I put in the chat in case anybody missed that. I wanted to do a couple shout outs. Um, we've got a, like a celebrity uh, among our attendees, Kathy DeCoster in retirement, um, former TPL director of federal affairs, who for decades literally was uh, a, you know, a leader on the Land and Water Conservation Fund, was instrumentally involved in the Highlands Conservation Act. So just wanted to give a shout out to Kathy. And um, I also wanted to thank AMC, um, <clears throat> you know, decades of consistent leadership on the highlands from the passage of the act to really becoming the keeper of the flame to doing the hard work year in and year out to make sure that the appropriations were there and that we got to full funding that we, that we remained at full funding and now for leading the charge um, on reauthorization so so huge thanks to amc for decades of leadership on the highlands thanks tom we're psyched to do it can't get people outdoors if there's no place for them to go. Um, okay, well, we, we got a thank you in the Q&A, so that's great. Um, and someone asked about uh, a recording of this session. We are recording and we will be archiving the session. I posted in the chat um, near the beginning of our time, uh, the multimedia page on the LWCF Coalition website where we have um, an archive of all these webinar sessions. Um, LWCF on the ground series has gone through all the sub programs of LWCF um, and presented these type of stories and resources for each. So I hope folks will check that out. We'll also send a copy of the recording to all of the registrants from today um, in a follow up email. So thank you all so much. Um, I urge you to check that out. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have a project toolkit on the website that contains links and resources and this type of information, not in webinar format, but in web page format for folks who are looking to explore the different, um, different types of projects um, and grants that are funded by the Land and Water Conservation Fund. 
Um, so thank you all again. And um, we hope to do more of these webinars uh, and we hope you'll join us again. Have a good afternoon.